Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to worship your name together. And Lord, I pray that we would bless your name in the middle of whatever it is that life has thrown at us or whatever we find ourselves in the middle of, that we would remember that you're still God, you're still in control. And even sometimes things that we don't fully understand or aren't able to grasp, we know that, that you have a plan in mind. And if we're willing to trust you and we're willing to, to put you first and to live for you, that you'll work the details out in a way that will please you and bring honor to your name. And, and that's all that we want. God, would you help us this morning to glorify your name, to worship you. In the next few moments as we look at your word, I pray that your spirit would clear our hearts and our minds that we would be able to understand what it is that you want to say to us. I pray that I would be careful in how I speak, that it would be your words that are spoken and not mine. And I pray that you would be pleased with the time that we have spent together here this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks. You can have a seat. If you were with us last week, uh, a little quiz for you. I'll give you a hint um, to help you with the quiz. You ready for this? We were in Nehemiah last week, and does anybody remember what we were talking about or, or kind of what the main thought was? I, I shouldn't do this. Okay, leaders, that's right. Nehemiah is the main book, right, as far as leadership is concerned. Phew, I did okay on that one. That one got through. And then what else were we talking about last week? Distractions, very good. Thank you, Michelle. She's a teacher. She knows what I'm going through. A test really isn't about what the, the, the students, it's about how well the teacher did, right? So, yeah, distractions, not being distracted. And if you're like me, and we talked about this a little, it's easy sometimes to be distracted, isn't it? And it's easy to lose sight of what it is that God has asked us to do. And sometimes when we do that, we get off, and we have a hard time to get back to where it is that God wants us to be. And so last week we talked about Nehemiah and the fact that there were some people from the outside who were trying to gain Nehemiah's attention and get him to come off the job that he was on. And they wanted to distract him from that job. But also there were some folks from the inside who were trying to get a hold of his attention and get, him, get his eyes off what God had asked him to do. And sometimes well-intentioned people in our lives can do that to us and without even knowing that that's what they're doing. And so last week we talked about being distracted. This week, what I want to do is I want to talk to you about where your focus should be. If, if we shouldn't be distracted, sometimes what happens to us is this. We think that it's all about the mission. Let me stop for a minute and let you think this through. We live in a country, we live in a culture, we live in a day and age where if we're on task and we're moving and we're doing something, then we're seen as successful and productive, right? Been doing some, actually I've been on a job for a long time on a house and been ripping apart an old, old farmhouse for someone and, and redoing it. And I redid a set of stairs for them in the old farmhouse that was built 140, 50 years ago. And it was, in some ways, a shame to take it apart. Uh, but the house had sunk and it needed to come apart. But when I was taking it apart, one of the things that I became very aware of was the craftsmanship that was part of that set of stairs. It had a curved start to the stairs came down to the bottom and it had a curve on the bottom that came out and around. The little pieces of trim that were part of that set of stairs up along the top of the stairs, I took them apart and when I did it, I w knew I wasn't going to use them again, but I was curious as, as to how they were built a hundred and some years ago. And so I took them apart as best I could in one piece, just so I could look at them. What I realized was that somebody had taken a board and they had taken however long it took them to do it, and they had shaped these round pieces out of a solid board, and they had slowly whittled all that out. And the back of those were still solid square, and the front had been whittled out round, all done by hand. You could see the marks in it where they'd done it by hand. 
And I thought about the craftsmanship and how long that took. And I could just picture, I don't know how it happened, but I could picture the guy who was working on that had his winter days by the fireplace because that place had a whole pile of fireplaces in it. And he sat down on his winter days with this dry piece of wood and he started whittling and he started carving and cutting out with all hand tools these pieces that he was going to make this set of stairs. And all the stairs, each stair, and I know I'm, I'm getting into detail here, but each stair as you went down the stairs was all cut and mortised and tendon all together, nicely done, jointed together, all by hand. And I thought about our culture and our society is the faster you can do it, right? The more money you'll make, the more efficient you become, and we've lost a lot of that craftsmanship, and we've lost it. And the reason is, is because we get into, here's the mission. We've got to get this accomplished. It doesn't matter how good you do. It doesn't matter the quality of it, as long as you get the mission accomplished. That's all that matters. And the sad thing is, is that, in, that that's translated into our Christian life and into our Christian living. And we go to seminars, and we read books, and we listen to seminars, and we do all this stuff thinking that, the more that we can cram into our head about God, the better as a Christ follower I'll be. And that's not true. Okay? Let me just throw that out to you this morning. It's not true. The whole thing about being a Christ follower is about a relationship with God that is over the long haul. It's not how much I get on the front side, folks. It's how much of a relationship that I develop with him over the long haul. It's a long time in the same direction. Robert and I were just talking about running a half marathon and a marathon. Robert's up for that, by the way. He's crazy, but he's up for it. It's a long time, Robert, in the same direction. That's a marathon. And our Christ life... Being a Christ follower is a long time in one direction. That's what God's concerned about. It's about our relationship with Jesus Christ. And so this morning, what I want to talk to you about, not being distracted, I want to go and I want to talk to you about the relationship that you have with Jesus Christ. Because, folks, that's the stuff. That's what actually matters. It's not, it's not about what you do. It's who you're becoming in Christ Jesus that matters. We're going to celebrate communion. We're going to start there. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, if you have your Bible, I want to read some verses. And I want to bring you to the point where why this relationship matters, why heading in this direction for a long time matters. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm going to start reading in verse 23. I'm going to read down through these verses, and then we're going to jump to another part in Hebrews to put this together. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. This is Paul writing. He's explaining the Lord's table to these people. He's explaining how they should go about celebrating communion. Okay? On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it into pieces and he said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant. Stop for a minute. What did he say it was? A new covenant. Is it an old covenant? It's a what? A new covenant. What is that supposing? That what? That there's an old covenant. Good job. Well done. I know it's hot, but you're with me. So this is a new covenant. It's supposing that there was a, okay, Hebrews chapter. We're going to go to Hebrews in a minute. I'm going to show you what the old covenant was because you need to know it. This cup is the new covenant between who? God and who? Okay, so this new covenant that's being made is between God, the creator of the universe, God, all right? Jehovah, the God who saw fit to create man and put man on this earth, the God who saw fit to have a relationship with man, the God who saw fit that when man sinned, he still loved him enough to say, I still want a relationship with man. And so he makes a way for that relationship to take place. And so this new covenant is between God and his people. All right? An agreement confirmed with my blood. 
This isn't just an agreement that's kind of like ho-hum, we made an agreement, if I break it, I break it. This is a, an agreement written in blood. This is saying, look, this is my life. And I am staking my life on this agreement that I am making with mankind. That's how serious this is. This isn't just a little maybe thing. This is all out completely, 100%. I'm all the way in, God saying, look, people, I will do this to the point that it will cost life, life blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time that you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes. So anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthy is guilty of sinning against the blood, the body and the blood of the Lord. Stop for a minute. We often don't go into these verses, but here's why these verses matter. And we're going to talk about it in a minute, a little bit, a little bit more. Dave. Who's, who made the covenant? God to who? And how did he sign the covenant? In blood. His life. His son's life. So when he writes this verse 27 and he says, if you decide to take this in an unworthy matter, manner, do you think it matters? It costs somebody their life. His son whose relationship, by the way, had never been broken. So it matters. Verse 28. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread and drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. That is why many of you are weak and sick and have some, and some have even died. But if we sh- would examine ourselves, we would not be judged by God in this way. Yet, When you are judged by the Lord, you are being disciplined so that you will not be condemned along with the world. So, my dear brothers and sisters, when you gather for the Lord's Supper, wait for each other. If you are really hungry, eat at home so you won't bring judgment upon yourselves when you meet together. I'm giving you, I'll give you instructions about the other matters when I arrive, after I arrive later. He's coming again to tell more. Okay, they would do this at their suppers, by the way. Communion would happen. They would have a communal supper. Everybody would bring something. They would eat, and then they would have communion. That's why that last verse is there. And he's saying, look, if you guys can't get enough to eat, don't use communion as a way to ruin all this, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, what did he say this was? Back up. It was a new covenant. Everybody got that? What did he say it was? It was a new covenant, which says that there was a... I'm saying this to make sure you're with me because it's, it's warm and I don't want you losing this. So it's a new covenant that God made, which there was an old. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. If you have your Bible, go to Hebrews chapter 10. I want you to understand why this matters. Starting at verse 1. The old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of good things to come. Not the good things themselves. Okay, so he's saying there was an old system. This is the old covenant that was there. All right, you ready for this? I'm going to explain this to you so you understand why we do communion. The sacrifice under the system were repeated how often? Okay, so here's what happened. There was an old system. Man, Adam and Eve back in the garden did what? What did they do? They sinned. They broke God's law. They, they, they ruined the fellowship between God and man with their sin. God can't look on sin. He is holy and just. He can't be in the sight of sin. He can't stand sin. And so they sinned and they broke the communication that God and man had. And because of it, God had to make a way that man could be right with him. And he did it through this sacrificial system. It was a preview. It was a picture of what was to come. So here we go. They did the sacrifice again and again. How often? Year after year. But they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. If they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifice would have stopped. And the worshipers would have been purified once and for all. And their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. You ever felt guilty? You don't have to put your hand up. Ever felt guilty? I'm sure we all have, right? Man, prior to Jesus Christ coming to the cross, felt guilty all the time because their sin was never completely dealt with. 
There was a priest who went into the presence of God and he sacrificed animals on a sacrifice on a, on a regular basis. We look at it now and we go, sacrifice to animals? We wouldn't do that. That's horrible. That was the price that was being paid for our sin. It was an example of the penalty of our sin. And God said, I need you to understand the cost of this sin. And the cost is that something needs to give up its life to pay for your sin. We look at sin today often in our culture and we go, oh, you know, they're just weak. Oh, everybody has their faults. Oh, you know, everybody fails once and every now and again. And we don't, we don't look at sin the way God does, folks. In our own lives, when we sin, we make excuses for why we are the way we are. Instead of going before a just and holy God and saying, God, I need your forgiveness. I need you to make me right. We're not broken for our sin. And these people felt the weight of their sin because they knew this, that their sin caused death. Our sin causes death in our soul. And God knew that. And so the old covenant was, He set up a way for man to see that their sin could be paid for. That there was a price that could be paid for their sin. So keep going. But instead, these sacrifices actually reminded them of what? Of their sins year after year. For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. That is why when Christ came into the world, He said, You did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you have given Me a body to offer. You were not pleased with burnt offerings, nor other offerings for sin. Then I said, look, I have come to do your will, O God, as is written about me in the Scriptures. First Christ said, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings or burnt offerings or other offerings for sin, nor were you pleased with them, though they were required by the law. Then he said, look, I have come to do your will. He cancels the first co- the old covenant, the first covenant. He cancels that. I lost my place. There it is. He cancels the first covenant in order to put the second covenant into effect. For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ. How often? Once and for all. Here's the difference. The old covenant meant this, that they had to do this day after day, year after year. Somebody had to pay a price for sin. And Jesus, who was perfect, came to this earth and he said, look, I'll do this and I will complete it. I will go to the cross. I will die for your sin. I'll pay the price for your sin. It'll be once and for all and it will be done. It'll be complete. I love this part. Under the Old Covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifice again and again, which can never take away sin. But our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sin, good for all time. And then he did what? Sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. He completed his work. And when it was complete, he sat down before God and said, There, I've finished the job you've given given to me. I paid the complete sacrifice for sin. It's all done. It's over. I've completed my work. I don't know about you, but I'm glad it was finished. Because you know what that means for me? Now, you may not know this about me. I'm going to tell you something. I'm perfect. Pam didn't look up. (laughs) You know what? If you've accepted Jesus Christ's payment for your sin, you can say the same thing. Before God, you are perfect. Because God looks at you through the finished work of Jesus Christ, the sacrifice that He made on your behalf on the cross, and He looks at you and He says, I see perfection because I see you through the finished work of Jesus Christ. I'm perfect. I know I'm not, I know I still struggle, but in God's eyes, because Jesus Christ covers me, He paid the price for my sin, I'm perfect. Thank you. You are too. 
Stop living in the guilt-driven life that you're living because in God's eyes, you're per- if you're a Christ follower, you are perfect. Does it mean you have nothing to work on? No, we still struggle with our sin nature and until we get to glory, until we get to heaven, we will. But in God's eyes, you are perfect. He did it for you. Complete. You can get excited later. I'm excited now. There he waits until his enemies are humbled and made a footstool under his feet. For by that one offering he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. That is me. That's me. I'm being made holy before God. I can't believe it. Say, you're nuts. I am. And the Holy Spirit, we've been talking about this for about two months now. The Holy Spirit also testifies that this is so. I'm not saying it. God's Holy Spirit is testifying on my behalf that that is true. He looks at me, Bill, and he says, that guy, he's perfect before God. The Holy Spirit does that on my behalf. For he says, this is the new covenant I will make with my people on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds, says the Lord. I will never again remember their what? Sins and, let's say that again, I will never again remember their, folks, do you get this? Jesus Christ went to the cross, paid the price for your sin, so that you could be forgiven, so that you could be free. And he says, I got a case of amnesia the moment that I finished that work, And when you accept the price that I paid for your sin, I don't remember it anymore. Not, I'm going to bring it up five years from now when it's convenient. I don't remember it anymore. You never have to worry about God coming to you and saying, hey, remember all those sins you did? No, if you've asked for his forgiveness and you've accepted the finished work of Jesus Christ for your sins, it's over. They're gone. Yeah. Folks, we live in a culture and we live in a time when people are walking around driven by guilt. You don't need to be. You are free in Jesus Christ if you have him in your life. You're free. I don't serve. I don't do the things I do at church. I don't live the way I live because I'm trying to please God so he would accept me. That's not why I'm doing it. I do the things that I do and I live the way I do because He has already accepted me. And I want to please Him. Because He loved me so much, He made me free. That's why I do what I do. And when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to what? This is awesome. There's no need for any more sacrifice. It's done. God says it's complete. It's over. That's the new covenant. The new covenant is this, folks. There's no need for any more sacrifice. Jesus already did that part. It's all over. You don't need to beat yourself up anymore. It's all over. God looked after that. He paid the price. It's complete. It's done. You are free in Jesus Christ. So live like it. Live like it. What I was talking about, not being distracted, folks, there are folks who are Christ followers who say they're living for God, but they're distracted because they're running their life trying to please God, trying to do enough to make God happy with them. You don't need to. If you accept His payment for your sin, then live like He's forgiven you because He has. You are free in Jesus Christ. You're not free to sin. Romans says, should I continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, why would you do that? He already paid the price for your sin. Now live to please him, live to honor him because he's done so much for you. Because he loved you so much. You serve him out of gratitude. Do you realize, I I came to realize this a, a while ago that God loves me so much, he saves me every day. Did you know that? doesn't mean I'm being saved from my sin. He saves me every day. He shows up in my life. He saves me from stuff I don't know anything about, which I'm glad I don't know anything about it. 
He saves me from stuff that I'm facing and I'm trying to carry myself. And he says, Tim, here, let me grab that and take that for you because that's what I do. He saves my family. He encourages them. He helps them. He puts his hand of protection on them. That's him saving me and caring for me and showing me his grace and his love. That's the new covenant. And when we do communion, communion is not something special where if you take this, all of a sudden you're in a different place with God. That's not the point. Communion is reminding me about the new covenant and keeping me focused on what Jesus Christ did for me. And he says, look, every time you take communion, you're to be reminded that Jesus Christ paid that sacrifice for you. It was a one-time event. It's finished. It's over. You're forgiven. And so when communion comes around, yeah, it's serious because it's what Christ did on the cross for us. He gave his life. But at the same time, it's a celebration. And I often want to cheer because I'm free. That's what I'm celebrating. When I celebrate communion, it's his broken body on the cross. It's his shed blood. But guess what? He didn't die and stay there, did he? He rose again. He lives. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. My Savior, my God is alive. And he, he does intercession for me. He pleads for me. So when I celebrate communion, it's not some old thing that we do that's traditional. It's keeping me on track. And it reminds me of who I am and who Christ is and what he did for me. And so this morning as we celebrate communion, I want you to be reminded. I want you to remember it's a new covenant. The old covenant, the old way didn't work. It was a system that made us look ahead to what Christ was going to do. And Jesus Christ came and he completed the act of forgiveness for us. Now, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 because there is a serious part to this. Yeah, that's great and it's forgiveness and it's wonderful. But look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 for a minute. Because I want you to understand that there's a part of this that God wants us to take very seriously. Look at verse 27. So anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord, you say it, what? Unworthily. Let me tell you what that word means. Let me tell you what that, that whole scenario is. God is saying this, look, if you've come to a life, a place in your life where you understood you needed Jesus and you accepted his gift of life, you accepted the price that his son paid on the cross, and you're a Christ follower, that's what this is about. But you've decided to go and live life your own way. You've decided to do some things your own way. And you've said to God, look, at this point, I don't need you right now. I'm, I've got this handled. And you're living in sin. That's what this means, unworthily. It's saying, you know in your heart that life is not what it's supposed to be between you and God. You know that you need to go to Him and you need to be humbled before Him and say, God, my life is not been, I'm not living it the way you've asked me to live it. I've defied your principles and I've chose to do this my own way. That's what unworthily means. So anyone who eats or drinks this unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of Christ. What he's saying is this, look, that was a serious matter. God sent His own Son, His perfect Son, to pay the ultimate price for your life. And when you thumb your nose, so to speak, at God and say, I'll do this my way, God's saying, what you're really saying is, God, I, I don't need the price that was paid. I got this one. You're sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread and drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. What he's saying here, and, and you can take this very seriously and you need to, is he's saying this, look, do a heart check. Take a minute. Take a look in your heart. You know. You know what's going on in there. Oh, you've probably hid it or you can hide it from other people but you know what's going on in there and it's not like this is a, a huge drawn out process God says this he says look do a heart check and then make it right that's it here's the wonderful thing about God not only did he forgive me but when I sin 
He doesn't stand up there with this big two-by-four saying, when he comes back, I got him. He doesn't do that. He says, oh, that Tim would come back. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> oh, I can't wait for that relationship to be restored. That's what he does. He looks at us and he says, oh, that that relationship, I paid so much for that relationship. And I love it when he comes to me and he talks to me and he hangs out with me. I love it when he listens to me. I love it when, when, when I can speak to him and he hears. Oh, I, I just, that's God. And he says, I can't wait for him to come and make it right. It's really what he does. And so when he says, examine your heart and check it, all he's saying is, look, if there's something out of place, put it back. <laughs> Ask me to forget. I'll do it. I'm all over. I'm, I'm there. I'm ready. I'm waiting. Open arms. Can't wait. So this isn't something that takes weeks and years and days and penance. and No, it's immediate. He says, come into my presence and ask for my forgiveness and I will grant it to you. I'll give it to you because I want that relationship to be restored and to be made right. So this morning before we take communion, if you're a Christ follower, would you check your heart? Do a heart check. If there's something out of place, get it right. Take a minute. Spend some time with God. Get it right. If it affects someone else, be sure you're going to get that right too. Have a chat. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe, maybe it's a co-worker that you need to go. Make sure you're going to do that. Make sure you're going to make that right. Because that's what God wants. He wants our hearts clean before him. David prayed, God, know my heart. And then make me aware of what's going on in there. And then make it right. Help me to make it right. And so that's what God asks of us, is that we would make it right. So in the next few minutes, we're going to have communion. The band's going to come and play. And communion, folks, is about us as a body, a family of Christ followers, celebrating the fact that the old covenant, the old sacrifice system, has been abolished. It's been wiped out. And he made a new covenant that was completed by the finished work of Jesus Christ so that we could be free and forgiven in Jesus Christ. It's a celebration as we take the bread and the cup this morning. It's a celebration, celebrating the fact that I am free in Jesus Christ. And so are you if you're a Christ follower. If you're not, you can be. Come to Christ and say, God, I know your son paid the price for my sin. And I ask you, would you forgive me? I accept the gift of life that you've given through your son, Jesus Christ. And he'll give it to you. He promises it's yours. And if you need to do that this morning, do it and join us in communion. You're free and you're, you're more than welcome to join us this morning. Um, I'm going to set up a second station because there's quite a few of us here. And uh, as the band plays, we'll, we'll celebrate communion. If you want to do it as a family, if you have young kids and you want to take a minute, just step off to the side and explain to your children what this really is all about. If, if you're not comfortable with communion, that's fine. You can stay in your seat. Nobody's going to think a thing about it. It's okay. No deal. And, uh, but would you join us? I'm going to pray. And then as you feel you need to come, come and take it uh, together as a family. Lord, thank you for the new covenant that's found in Jesus Christ. Thank you that Jesus went to that cross and paid the price for my sin first. For everybody's sin that's, that's in this room and, and in the town that we live in. But, but God, you, you did it for me. You saw me and you knew I needed someone to help me because I had a sin problem. And you made that right. Thank you. Thank you that I am forgiven. <laughs> and I'm free in Jesus Christ this morning. Thank you that I don't need to carry the load of guilt that Satan would love to place on me. Thank you that you've taken that. You've made it right. Thank you that I have access to your presence and that, that God the Father th sees me through his son, Jesus Christ. And I thank you for the fact that your spirit testifies on my behalf before God. Thanks for loving me and wanting a relationship with me this morning. God, would you guide us in the next few moments as we celebrate communion? I pray that we would honor you with that. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for instituting this uh, symbol for us to practice, to remember that Jesus Christ brought freedom for us price has been paid, the new covenant has been set. You're a God who never goes back on his word and what you say is always right and true. We're seen 
guiltless before the Father. Our sins are forgiven and forgotten. God, would you help us in this week to not be distracted by all the stuff that comes into our life, but to remember that we have a relationship with the God of the universe through his son, Jesus Christ. That you want to use us to help others understand the truth about God and the fact that you love them and you want a relationship with them too. Father, would you help us to live in that relationship in such a way that others would see it in us and want it. Use us, change us, make us like your son. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for being here this morning.